I'm your host, Sarah Hendren, for the next panel, and I'll just wait till the other panelists arrive um, to the main stage here. Thanks so much, Danielle. Uh, I truly cannot imagine a, a single better person to um, give this keynote and to set the stage for us for such difficult thinking work together. Um, I do imagine that folks are going to be arriving, but I'll just start in the interest of time. Um, I am a middle-aged white woman with long dark hair and a black dress, and I'm sitting in front of a stack of books and a big abstract painting that my brother made for me. Um, I want to welcome you to the first panel of this festival in such a week and in such a year. And I want to invite you in just the next 50 short minutes to explore three big, quite big conceptual areas that are alive and very much under construction, as Daniel just said, as our subjects this week. So big areas where I think you could product productively take with you into the next three days um, beyond to sharpen up and maybe give some more dimension to your own thinking from whatever profession or domain brings you here. We'll drop into the first one first, our first area, and that is the familiar and enduring public spaces of our physical cities. And Danielle gave us some of those big typologies from history, but the, the contemporary city, the bricks and mortar, the concrete and parks and plazas of our lives. And we'll think again first about what's made possible and what's challenging about our physical shared space. And then we'll make a leap by analogy from the realm of physical to the realm of digital public spaces. And we'll think about what continuities are there. This is that one level down of granularity. Where, how do we make uh, continuities from the physical to the digital? And where do the real distinctions arise that come with the nature of software? And then we'll make another big leap to thinking about public space. Yes, as the public sphere, as Danielle laid out in the political sense that of course encompasses both the physical and the digital. And perhaps, of course, it seems self-evident that public spaces become the public sphere. They are the stages and the settings of our lives, the places that do collect us and indeed sometimes collectivize us. But I do think many of us carry around some perhaps overly vague notions about what healthy digital public space looks like. Perhaps we think we recognize it when we see it in a broad thumbs up or thumbs down. This is where it's working. Here's a lot of places where it's not really working. Or perhaps we have a diagnosis that's shaped very much from our own point of view, either our training and our research or the neighborhoods where we live, the cities where we are, we have some sense of what goes well and some sense of what doesn't go well, but we lack a lot of the conceptual handles and the granularity that we need. So the invitation this week is to get that granularity and specificity to invigorate our imagination about public spaces as the public sphere and what it takes to shore up that publicness in our many ways from wherever we sit. Because again, just to underline Danielle's point, the, the mechanisms of influence actually run two ways. We know this, but it's important to say again that our political and civic ideals arrive in our lives in evidence of stuff. So material culture, it's embodied in the material stuff, the way we move and live and extend our bodies and the way that we, the social architecture of our online spaces are a reflection. So from ideals to spaces, but the opposite direction, of course, is also true that the quantitative and qualitative look and feel and experience in tiny subtle ways of our spaces does shape what becomes possible in our civic relationships to one another both ideals to spaces and spaces to ideals. And I imagine that many of you come primarily from one spot or the other, and we might engage a, a, like a proper humility about the limits and the affordances of our own space, right? And also a much more robust imagination about the dynamism that's happening in both those directions. So I think each of these thinkers will give us more to think about that we might not have considered before, no matter where we sit. So let me introduce them to you just briefly. Their long bios are on the website, so I don't want to spend too much time there. Um, Gabriela Gomez Mont uh, founded and directed Laboratorio para la Ciudad, or Laboratory for the City, which was the award-winning experimental and creative office uh, of the Mexico City government that reported to the mayor. And she headed a young transdisciplinary team from urban geographers, political scientists, civic tech experts, to artists, historians, and philosophers. I just my heart sings that humanists are right there in the middle of the laboratory for the city. That lab was created to tackle urban challenges at all scales, so we'll hear more about that work. Next, uh, we'll, we have Konstantinos Dimopoulos, who started his career in urban planning, so in that physical space, 
and city geography, and later moved to combine his knowledge of urbanism with his love for designing games. And in doing so, he helped to establish the young field of game urbanism. So since then, he's designed cities, urban mechanics, narrative geographies, for tabletop and video games. And he's also the author of Virtual Cities. So he'll be a bit of that connective tissue between those two worlds. We then have Philip Rosedale. Um, in 1999, Rosedale founded Linden Lab and built a virtual civilization that many of you know called Second Life, um, creating an open-ended internet connected virtual world. He worked since then in distributed work and computing and excited by the proliferation of VR, he re-entered virtual design, the design of virtual spaces in 2013, founding High Fidelity. So he'll talk to us about those things. Jay Verdi, um, I, I welcome from my, my, also my home discipline of um, disability studies. Jay is a historian of medicine, technology, and disability. And she thinks a lot about access to public spaces and institutions of all kinds. And people with disabilities, of course, have been way out in front on shaping and reshaping the public space that is the public sphere in the physical space and in digital space. Um, so I'll ask her to talk about barriers and opportunities of all kinds there. She's an assistant professor at the University of Delaware and the author of Hearing Happiness, Deafness Cures in History. So I want to just jump in if we can. And Gabriella, I'll ask you first about the design of our physical cities. So most people can easily intuit what a plaza or an open green space is that is for getting together broadly conceived. This kind of idea that proximity creates good diversity and therefore health kind of axiomatically. And we know that that can be true, not always true, but I'd like you to talk about some less familiar, subtler interactions that city spaces also make possible that people might not have thought of before when the design is intentionally in a civic spirit. So examples are welcome here, but the floor is yours. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Sarah. I'm incredibly happy to be here. It seems to be such a timely conversation, so urgent and full of raw questions, if not answers as of yet. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, I, I um, headed the lab for six years. I'm a recovering citizen in many ways. I've been out of the lab for about a year and a half and a lot of reflection still. Um, and we had a quite a wide agenda, and I think especially two things are in, incredibly relevant to the conversations today. Uh, one of them, even though you find me in Spain with the sun setting behind me, um, I actually hail from Mexico City. And uh, Mexico City, for those of you who have not been, is uh, one of the largest cities in the world, 21 million people in a metropolitan level, 9 million people city proper. And it is not only the, the, the it's not only a gargantuan city, but it is also an intensely diverse city in many ways. Like the DNA of the Mexico City, I believe, is unlike any other just because of the sheer uh, just like scope of possibilities you can find in it. But diversity is also many times translated into divisiveness. So Mexico City housed everything from the former number one billionaire of the world, now paltry, I think, number seven or eight. Uh, but it also has one of the lowest minimum wages of all of Latin America. So leading a lab that had to tackle urban, technological, social questions, and very much interested in, in the realm of both public space as well as democratic practices, in many ways, we actually had to take into account all of this uh, diversity when we threw ourselves into the very uh, <laughs> arena, if you will, if not yet agora, of what it actually entails to, to, to bring together participatory practices and such incredibly First diverse off and unique points of view. Uh, so one of our big questions at the beginning was in all of our projects, including the public space projects, first of all, how do we think of this diversity and divisiveness? So in terms of public space, one of the things that we started doing quite quickly, which is also this merging uh, point between technology, the digital, as well as the urban and the physical, was uh, to create the first GIS and urban geography, if you will, a view of Mexico City and to be able to map out let's say for our kids agenda, uh, one of the teams was called the Playful Cities Team, which basically thought of play as an urban making tool and also uh, thought of Mexico City from the view of kids. Uh, believe it or not, we actually have almost 5 million kids under age 14 in the metropolitan area. So that's kind of like the size of Finland. And how do you bring back civicness into that space? And we researched really interesting things such as in, in the 40s, there was actually a syndicate of kids talking about Danielle's public sphere that actually got this solved um, because it became so active. So, you know, there, there is so many things to think about the space. But anyway, going back to that, um, even though Mexico City, for example, in terms of 
uh, both green space as well as public space has more or less the number of square meters per inhabitant that organizations such as the UN ask for, which is nine square meters of green space, for example, per, per person. Um, when you start getting down into the scales of the city and go granular, one of the things that we find is that divisiveness, social divisiveness actually translates into the urban and the built environment as well. So we will have places such as um, the stop. Miguel Hidalgo uh, borough, which has um, almost 42 square meters of green space and others such as Iztapalapa that have less than four and also half a million kids, by the way. So we start, we created tools, for example, of being able to map out uh, how many kids we had in all of the city block by block, cross that with indexes of marginalization and segregation, and then cross that again with lack of access to public space. So we could actually buffer zones and then zoom in. And we created both a long-term plan, but also a short-term plan. So then we get into the, the one of the, the, the topics that I was obsessed by, which is, Yes, we, we should be thinking about public spaces, which is all important, but how do we actually also translate this into civic spaces as well? Because public space can be a place where many bodies meet, but that there's not necessarily any type of interaction, but a civic space or, or the public sphere that Daniel was speaking about is actually about the intensity of interaction. So then you think about density in a very different way. And when we were rescuing and creating public space in these places where there was none, or actually creating things such as play streets for kids in neighborhoods. One of the things that we found is that it is incredibly interesting to be to start thinking about these micro civic typologies, if you will, and to be able to amplify it, not only the coffee place of your or perhaps our uh, town halls of the present day, but how can even let's say mom and pop shops at the corner are very naturally a place where information gets concentrated and disseminated. And these public spaces that we started creating because we wanted to translate them into a place where people also came together, not only in, in their bodily form, but also uh, engaged with each other. Um, because there's an issue of trust that's quite interesting that I, I can get into later on. Uh, that in a way, it's very interesting to see, see not only how we design public and civic spaces, but who designs them as well. So this whole thing of bringing the community together to be able to jointly decide on things was incredibly interesting because in many of these communities, since Mexico City sprawled 35 times in size from the 60s to the 90s, many close kit knit communities became uh, strangers to each other. So neighbors many times don't know each other. Uh, sometimes when we were creating like the play streets and we'd go knocking on doors and say like, hey, you know, we want to do these play streets for the kids. And they're like, no, no, there's not that many kids here in the neighborhood. And suddenly you close down a door and you flood the streets with kids. And suddenly there's a, a voice and a visibility to be had of these people that were basically behind locked doors. Um, so that I think is one of the conversations that has followed me beyond government of again like this transformation of the public to the civic i think mexico city is a great example of how we think about this because we cannot wait for the world to uh to be frictionless as ellie was mentioning at the beginning uh we actually need to go into the very mists of all of these tensions that arise and it's actually going deeper into this deeper into democracy deeper into meeting people deeper into disagreements even that we can come out of it in in other ways um in things such as crowdsourcing the Mexico City Constitution and whatnot, we also had some incredible examples of what that means. Uh, not for the faint-hearted, I must say, but also incredibly interesting in, in terms of how do we start thinking about uh, that transformation of, um, of the urban scape into a civic space in many ways. Yeah, and Gabriela, I just want to underline for people who don't know your work that the, the play streets was literally take, not, not going in always and building new green spaces where there had been none or recreation spaces, but repurposing extant space by shutting down um, car access to a stretch of street to precisely to demonstrate, as you say, to rescue space where there had been none or to recover from some other place and then to make visible just how many kids are uh, actually present in a neighborhood and the, the dynamism of that, the pragmatism of it, the nimbleness of being able to move and act in those ways, I think is quite something. A lot of times software, I think, is driven by this very frontier mentality of sort of staking a claim and the newness and the city has this way of contextualizing and binding us to its its very concrete structures, literally. 
Absolutely. I think uh, part of the question of how you travel the scales of the city, that that is another of, you know, it's, it's not only the spatial question of the spatial scales, but it's also a time scale, if you will, that you need to travel. So That's we right. were thinking, like, how do we give tools to, th to think about this in the long term? But the immediate term is, you know, start closing down streets. And since this this tool that I mentioned actually took us to some of the most marginalized and dangerous parts of Mexico City, um, in many ways, it was also incredibly interesting to think how do we create, for example, new typologies for, for informal settlements, for example, where the play streets then become permanent and where one of a couple of my team members are still working with one of those boroughs um, in terms of these type of projects. And it's also interesting because you need to deal like you there's you cannot be uh, blindsided by uh, idealism. You have to go deep into reality because in, in many of these neighborhoods, we actually had to negotiate with the local drug dealers, for example. And kids, weirdly enough, became a really interesting vehicle to be able to negotiate a safe space, which we're not here to change your ways. That are, that's another city department. But how do we actually create a social pact where these become safe spaces because there's kids across the area? So, and, and that was actually a quite interesting tool. And I have several examples of how working with a community, you can bring in and have much more nuanced notions of what the right to the city is uh, for many often marginalized communities in many ways, such as homeless, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. I want to just underline that the distinction between public and civic that may come back um, in some other. So Constantinos, I'm going to ask you next, if you can, to mark some connections and distinctions between physical cities and virtual cities, perhaps, you know, calling to some of these principles that Gabrielle has kind of given us. Um, what are some principles or metaphors from for public social interactions that you've learned in making that leap from architecture to virtual social spaces? So things that maybe are continu continuous, those kind of productive ideas in architecture that translate online, or perhaps where they fall apart and where the analogy breaks down. So first of all, I would love to thank you too. Uh, being here is uh, fascinating so far and feels lovely already, so thank you. And to introduce myself, I'm Kostandinos. I'm, I'm in Greece, I, I work from Greece and I generally stay here and never really leave Europe too much. So it's uh, even more interesting for me to to be part of this. And before actually answering you, I, I think that I found I found Gabriela's uh, you know points absolutely fascinating because I have this this entrenched uh, thing in my mind that you know generally speaking tools and designs cannot really change much or, or they can just go up to a point and and what she demonstrated was a very very you know, impressive example that goes directly against my experience. And this is actually pretty nice and hopeful and everything. And it, it's also something that, that bridges nicely with the fact that sometimes tools uh, can at the very least help us imagine things. And this, this, is, this is a thing that games can do very well. They, they can actually take the abstract and the impossible and the completely imaginary and give it a sort of special form. They can make it plausible in our minds. So probably they are the medium that could perhaps give, uh, you know, utopia a very, a very real sense. Anyway, to, to see how physical and virtual urbanism, let's say, connects, we have to understand that they really are very different on one side. I mean, on, on the physical side, you have the laws of actual physics, you have uh, the laws of humans that dictate how things are to be done. And you have very specific functional and societal needs that have to be served. On the other hand, in, in, in virtual space, we usually have to only face production restraints and, and the limit, limitations of our tools and computers and mostly strive to create believable illusions. So uh, if you want to look at it historically, public space in video games was mostly in this, and I'm mostly speaking on uh, single player games, on stuff you get to enjoy and experience by yourself. Multiplayer games are a totally different thing, which, which I believe we will go in later. But so um, what, what we first strived for was to recreate the feeling of a real city. We wanted just our worlds to look real, not necessarily function as real. We wanted to imitate and perhaps even become uh, inspired by reality. It wasn't 
a conscious uh, thought in, in in most designers, you know, minds to to try and create the essence of public space because you know public space and i think we all realize that it it has like many aspects to it it can be it can be everything and it can be it, it can change status it can it can be about just connecting spaces in in the city or it can be a civic space as uh, you know danielle for example said a place where politics actually happen it can be a demonstration space it can be something we just enjoy being in and you know looking around it, it's very interesting that um the way people realized the public space in medieval times was like everyone tried to you know make things beautiful so you would create your house as beautifully as possible in order to add to the beauty of the city and this was how you understood your civic duty it was like being part of the beautification project of everything this was a major function of uh, public space so anyway as um as things have become more complicated in games and as, uh, you know, the illusion of reality gets more convincing, I do believe that we do tend to at least look back at the methods that urbanists and architects and engineers use in order to recreate them. For example, we, and I think that many, many base their um, designs on the works of, you know, Lynch and their works of uh, Alexander and Butler Language, and they try to, uh, think about boundaries and uh, the ways that architectural spaces succeed each other and how to create the feeling of uh, awe or alienation or, or coziness, depending on what it is we need. It's still not something that we will um, try to, to use to emphasize sociability when it comes to single period game, but once again, to, to help with the illusion of uh, this sort of space. But more interestingly, when we go to multiplayer games, and that is games where people play with each other, what we usually do is like try to identify the parts of uh, public space that we care for. So that would probably have to be perhaps some sort of um, minimal trade and discussion, maybe the opportunity for people to actually do stuff with other people and enjoy the fact that they are in the presence of other humans and and this is where things can get more interesting and and where the spaces that the tools of gaming allow us to create can become uh, you know also the spaces where we get to interact not just as avatars not just as um, you know players but as people who want to discuss stuff so this would be like my very very first uh, approach to things I just want to bring in Philip here too because it's related um, and I want to bring in another dimension if that's okay, Konstantinos. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. So in a related way, Philip, I'll just ask you to talk about Second Life and High Fidelity, your choice, um, but the kinds of design choices that make virtual spaces do their best social work. And I think plenty of people are used to, to thinking about virtual worlds at the individual level, the node of this user. So I've got my preferences, my settings and my choices. But of course, it's a different matter to design interactions to make those spaces work as publics. And that's a really more, that's a really, and in fact, we have these professional fields that are user experience and user interaction design, right? The, the, just the individual node that that presumes when of course our interactions are what make those spaces sticky and welcoming or not. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, thank you. I've been watching that city emerging from the water behind us there. And, and that's so cool. Um, when Second Life began, for those who don't know it, it's a 3D world that was designed to be very open and, as, as Sarah said, um, to be a sort of a scaffolding for a lot of human interaction. And so that's what, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of watching over, my gosh, 15 years now, um, as people have used Second Life. But it actually started as a small... Uh, village like that it was only a few acres kind of quite literally in the water if you walked out to the edge of it in 3d you saw something and if you'd watched a time lapse of it you'd have seen something very much like what we're watching on screen there second life grew we we and, and this is interesting we auctioned off new bits of land at the edges of it as it got bigger much like what we're watching there and so it, 
the mechanism of that was one of perhaps a bit more capitalism looking back now than, than I, I personally think we would have wanted, but people sort of spread out into that space. But yes, as you said, Sarah, the, the, um, the mechanism I was always interested in was what were the low level kind of laws of physics, if you will, and how would they make people act around each other you know what uh what capabilities what fairness was established what force could people use to um resolve their disputes and i've always been fascinated in this public challenge of structuring the low level rules themselves you know the laws of physics if you will to make the space more or less you know workable for people and i've always approached the problem of these public spaces or these online spaces with that thought in mind kind of less so the administrative rules which are of course material as well um you know what if, when when someone does control the space or to whatever extent they control the whole space how do they act as the administrators but then there's this alternative question which is were there no one there what are the laws of physics and how does that then and i mean that broadly and how does that work out in terms of of changing behavior you know that's what has been a constant fascination to me in these well in my whole career and and, and now most recently, we've been trying to do this with high fidelity again, first with VR headsets, and now strangely enough, in this, in this bizarre time of, of COVID, uh, trying to redo it in a vastly simplified, just audio, just a two-dimensional display and sort of exploring what happens there. But my fascination has always been with, and why I love being here with this group, is this question of, yeah, what are the rules and how does that affect behavior and what are the psychologies and social psychologies of interaction that we have to be mindful of and then how can we optimize that to create, uh, you know, not a good business, but a, a real public space. And I think I'm going to just bring Jay in here too, but I want to just note, Philip, that I think, I mean, I think about uh, Jane Jacobson famously saying, it's actually the self-organizing properties of the street that is the the informal planning and the eyes on the street the mixed zoning the ways that people actually live together and do this kind of informal sociality but she was talking about a, a bounded space that did not have the exponential even liquid scale of software um and and so that that's kind of laissez-faire you know letting the laws of physics emerge is a really it's a is a bigger tension it seems to me um and that's where we it took us a while to figure out things like context collapse it's interesting to think about whether that's also in the literature of cities that somehow we missed making the the kinds of connections so i'll ask you to come back in about that but jay um i just want to ask you uh, to weigh in on um you look a lot at, at products and technologies more than at cities but as a disability studies historian um, you're, you've charted the ways that design products often have been formed on a logic of fixing people's bodies when they find that they fall outside the norm. But we know that the material space of our cities, think of curb cuts and ramps and all kinds of fundamental reshapings of the city, even at infrastructural scale, have, has come from the knowledge and the wisdom and the activism and power of disability, uh, of, of people with disabilities, um, who call themselves disabled people, audio, audible pedestrian signal uh, signals you know, policies for assistance animals, all kinds of physical spaces we can look at. And the last year, we've seen, of course, the digital space sub in for material space in all kinds of new ways, which bring their own forms of barriers to access. So what kinds of principles or practices would you hope to see in the design of digital public spaces based on what you know about disability history and technology, both the creativity of that refashioning work and also the urgency of the politics? Hi, thank you um, for that great question. I do want to note that um, I'm currently broadcasting to you all from Newark, Delaware, which is the unceded land of the Lenin and Lapi tribe. And to give a very brief visual description of myself, I'm an Indian woman with shoulder length curly hair coming to you from my home office, which is surrounded by books and plants. So the usual historian office here. So um, as Sarah mentioned, a lot of my thinking about disability technology focuses on how disabled people tend to either create or modify the technology to better align to their bodies and navigate through their um, environmental and urban spaces. This does mean that often disabled people encounter barriers where their understanding of technology and their, um, their sense of movement doesn't always parallel with the society in which they live in. And I was listening to Danielle's presentation and thinking about her comment on public design and private design 
intersecting to channel power and what that means when a person body is the, it can be perceived as a barrier for full participation in a democratic society. So Sarah, you mentioned like curb cuts of wheelchair, and you know it's a very famous example in disability history in where disabled people in Berkeley started arguing that curb cuts would allow them for greater social, civic, and democratic participation in their cities because it would allow them to move with their wheelchairs. But it's also kind of a universal design which anybody can benefit from curb cuts. You know, um, people using strollers, people using shopping carts, people who use canes and things like that. It just seemed to be a very inclusive design. I'm thinking more and more about digital spaces because for the past few years, disabled people have, have been pushing this activism that, that digital spaces can be more inclusive for everyone. But in some of the challenges that they advocate for, including, um, for example, closed captioning being mandatory on all public spaces online, have been met with a lot of resistance, if not tension, from companies, corporations, institutions, um, for reasons from financial um, explanations or there's not enough of an audience or, you know, not really want to put in the design or technical expertise to include something like that. And just a side note, I do want to express my gratitude to New Public for making sure that there is an ALSL interpreter and this excellent captioning, perhaps the best I've seen on a Zoom webinar, by the way. So thank you for that. And I've also been thinking about what it means when we argue for democratic public spaces online and not provide even the basic accessibility parameters. So we've been seeing lots of social media contacts since the summer following the George Floyd murder and the Black Lives Matter protesting, all kinds of social media commentary about politics and public spaces and participation. But most of these content are not accessible. They don't come with alt text, they don't come with captioning, and that further provides barriers for disabled people for being able to participate in these social conversations. At the same time, you know, looking at it in a different vein, these digital spaces are also open to participation. So people who might not physically be able to go out in the street and protest find themselves much more comfortable, if not protected, by participating in online activism. So we have this kind of two approaches to making sure so the digital spaces are accessible. Well, on one hand, they give people an inclusive platform to share their thoughts and participate in their own sense of activism, as well as to share the ideas about civic nature. But on the other hand, they can also be exclusive because if we don't use the technology that is in our disposal, to make sure these spaces are accessible or we design new platforms with accessibility as an afterthought for further um, propagating these kinds of barriers that are reflective of the more physical spaces that we have there. Now I've been thinking a lot about these kinds of accessibility and how organizations get together to provide these kinds of spaces. So one of the um, groups that emerged in the summer with regard to other social media activism is a group of volunteers who call themselves protest access. And they often work with Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to caption any content or provide all text description for anybody who wants that. All you have to do is tag them and they will organize the group of volunteers and do the work. That is a time consuming process. And often they tend to be several hours or several days in some cases behind the um, access provision. But last week when Twitter was suspending President Trump video because of the, um, you know, the terrorism on January 6th, protest access actually captured the video that was being, um, being taken down. But then their own account, because they showed that video, got shut down. So it raises this broader question, I think, about if we make the basis accessible for people, to what extent do we also limit democratic participation? So I think when we're talking about both digital and physical spaces and artistic design, it's also very important for us to also think about these spaces as whether or not they are accessible. Yeah, wow. And this is, it's, it, what you're saying just reminds me of what Danielle said about the very particular 
combination of public and private entities that come together, not without friction, but to build those kinds of new worlds. And we're seeing that right now. So we're seeing both AI generated automated captions grow in their fidelity. And you know, I, I feel like I watched in real time the way YouTube's captions went from kind of comically bad to a little bit better to, wow, really quite good, you know? But then also the debates about the human decisions that are involved in sign and also in live captioning and the standards that make those things possible. But thank you for that rich example of both public institutional work and private work that's you know working this out right now i want to uh i want to then just ask danielle um to come in here again um and weigh in on the big picture questions that inform so much of your thinking about civic life perhaps in reaction to what you've heard on the panel thus far about architectural urban and virtual space um, you often talk for instance about the healthy relationality that characterizes strong civic life and there's a rich ample scholarship in your field about what fair fighting is, for example, as a term of art, right, in thinking about how we interact, what, what fair fighting constitutes, um, about deliberation, disinterested deliberation as part of that healthy relationality. And again, it begs us to go deeper than this broad sense of togetherness and to say what we mean about the agonism of the public sphere and what it means to be pluralistic, truly. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how good friction can be productive in our public lives and how the shape of our digital worlds might shore up that relational health or I give the, you the floor to interact with anything that's been said thus far. Oh, thank you, Sarah. And so actually, let me, I forgot to do my audio description. So I'm a African, middle-aged African-American woman with short uh, kinky hair wearing a blue sweater with uh, orchids behind me, pink orchids. Um, so, I mean, this is a fascinating conversation and really wonderful to hear the parts come together. I wanna start actually with Gabriella's comments and her point about focus on kids. There's also a designer who you may know, um, Joel Lamke, I believe, who has a concept called Kid Cities, um, which is to ask the question of if you start by asking, how do we um, ensure that you know the kids are okay, that, that they're healthy environments for young people, a lot of other things will follow from that. And in that regard, it's very similar, I think, to a lens that starts with disability and ask the question of how do we make sure there's access for everybody? A lot of other things follow from that. So in some sense, starting with the most vulnerable and asking how do we make sure this is good for them is likely to deliver benefits for all of us. Um, in that regard, you know, I've had my own recent challenges with my kids uh, navigating social media and encountering quite dangerous things, in fact, actually, and being um, subject to predatory behavior. And you come to realize that when you send them out into the city, physical city around us to ride their bike, there are street signs and there's road markings. And you can say to them, you know, don't go past X street or past Y street, and they can have their independence within boundaries. And none of those markings are particularly available um, you know, in the internet space. So the point is just that, that suggests that we really haven't asked these questions about how do we think about the broad design in ways that are good for kids, um, broad design in ways that are good for um, communities of disabled people. So I want to just you know, think those are really helpful frames for giving us overarching goals. Um, and so then the question is, um, you know, I think within that, so those frames, um, how do you sort of bear down on the technical work? And here I think it's actually worth kind of paying attention to the way in which um, we are quite good at some things. For example, we're quite good at privacy, right? And we have like, you know, an amazing sort of list of things we do to focus on privacy and user uh, documents and agreements that have to be signed and so forth. And if you think back to my original kind of five buckets of things we have to deliver, material security, protection for negative rights, protection for positive rights, social rights, and non-domination, you know, those really all fall under the bucket of protecting negative liberties. So there's a certain kind of discipline we could bring to the work of just sort of really asking across those categories, you know, how could we design to support these things? Um, and then that I think is, is Philip's point about social psychologies and how they come into play in terms of delivering protections for those different categories of rights and goods. And to some extent, we're going to have to learn as we go. We don't know the answer up front precisely because um, digital technologies do give us new kinds of infrastructures. And therefore, we do have the job of understanding the, the laws of physics, so to speak, the laws of social psychology as they are uh, activated by this kind of infrastructure. Um, so that is key. And then the last thing, just to come to your point about relationships and fair fighting and so forth, um, and I think that is, is it's, it is this issue of difference where you started, right? Um, that is the hardest thing, which is um, we, as of yet, even in our physical worlds, 
actually have not successfully designed infrastructure um, to support productive friction, you know, kind of comprehensively. We have the problem of segregation, whether that's ethnic or racial or socioeconomic. Um, you can find cases of success. And so I think in that regard, what one has to do is really try to pull out success cases in the physical world and understand why are some infrastructural efforts going so badly wrong with regard to difference and others going right? And then what learnings can we take from that to port into the digital space? But the point is it really is unfinished work. Um, it deserves a kind of, you know, a spotlight put around it so that we can focus on it. Yeah, thank you. I wanna just pause in case somebody wants to jump in on anything thus far, because I have a, a couple of other questions, but just pausing. Can I say one more thing about fair fighting? Because I, I didn't really. Of course. Um, so here's a place where I would say, again, we're really good at thinking about privacy, which is to say really good at thinking about negative liberties and just really bad at thinking about positive liberties, participatory rights, participatory inclusion. Yes. And it just, it, it's not that there's an answer out there actually, and you know, a philosopher can just port it into the conversation. It's that we have to just switch gears and recognize the value of successful participation. The London work is a good example where they really reviewed their all of the kind of ways in which different social practices were coming together in their community um, to support quality relationality, egalitarian dynamics among people and um, participation, basically. And I think you have to take those three categories together and use them as the kind of triangles of a design process. Constantine. What I, yes, what I would like to add would be that the, the major problem that I can think of with the digital public space is the fact that it will it will come with a preset of uh, laws and guidelines that will essentially define its use. I mean, especially if we want to to make it as impressive and as um, easy to use as possible, because admittedly, you know, the complexity of even getting online is too much for for quite a lot of people and admittedly many don't even have access to the internet or to anything vaguely technological and this is like a, a big percentage of, of humans living on the planet right now so if, if we are to to give all those people the access and enable them i have the fear that there will have to be some sort of really powerful entity enabling them to come online and participate and this entity will most probably have the power to keep the conversation safe for itself so this this might for example you know limit the political conversation limit um uh dissent up to an acceptable point and this is something that i cannot imagine is a purely technical question and it's more probably a, a political or, or ethical one and i'm not certain as to how exactly we could go around and fix it, at least for now. I mean, we could easily discuss how the people that already are here can, you know, create their spaces, which are like subsets of a true, truly public space where they can discuss and protest and whatever, but like making it on a global space for everyone, I, I think it's going to be really well, difficult. Can I just say, I want to get Gabriela in here, Constantinos, but I actually do, when you say they come with preset laws and you're imagining global scale, it seems to me those are also human presumptions, right? That that are driving mm. the, we're going to hear from Front Porch Forum in Vermont, where in a neighborhood forum, you can only post once a day. There's a temporal friction there. So mm. you don't get into, I learned about this from Eli, you, learn, you don't get into flame wars because you can't be mad for two weeks over the cycling thing in your neighborhood as you can on next door. You can just okay, like, this you know. So the subtleties of that friction seems to me does in fact shape those preset laws, right? That it's not just a free for all, everybody, anybody say what they want in real time, but you can intervene, it seems to me, and shape, mm -hmm. we just have come to accept a quite short history of the social internet and the way that it works as though it must be that way. So but Gabriella, do you wanna talk a little bit about participation and it's- Absolutely, yes, I, I, I actually wanted to add a, a little bit to Constantino's uh, comment about how much design can seem or not or not be or not be gratuitous and one of the things that we found quite interesting is actually studying even the architecture of power in terms of even the office spaces of many of the ministers or the mayor himself there's so many things that happen subconsciously they're signing 
uh, signaling hierarchy, they're assigning who belongs there and who doesn't, um, who's allowed to speak and who isn't. And so one of the, the, the places that we created as, as one of these typologies of civic spaces, we had a, an amazing huge rooftop in Mexico City. And we opened it up not only for, we thought, okay, like how do we actually turn a public building into a public space as well, where people not only come for services or complaints, but actually to share ideas, to debate them, et cetera, et cetera, and to our huge surprise, um, because one of the things that I didn't mention in terms of even designing for trust, um, Mexico City in the last, Pew, Mexico rather, in the last Pew survey, 2018, um, only 8% of Mexicans believe in democratic practices. So I mean, that was the challenge that we had at the beginning. But at the same time, we found that when you open the doors for discussions, it's truly astounding to see how many people want to come in to discuss ideas about their city and not only to talk about them, but actually to sink the, their hands into the city themselves. Um, so we had, it was truly interesting to see how even the, the this, we designed the space where we would take away, we, we would take everybody's ties away no mayor or minister, ta, ta, ta. it was all um, on a first name basis. And we, for the most convoluted subjects that we had talking about uh, fair fighting, when we were putting together activists and people for government for the first time, and really wanted to see where, how we could create a, a coalition of, of the willing, if you will, for things such as road safety in Mexico City, um, we found one of our secret we weapons was what we call the sobremesa, which was putting together people to share a meal usually over dinner. I confess we also had mezcal, which is, you know, probably the secret, the secret is to weapon and most powerful one of them all because it just puts you in a nice little hazy mood. But it's, it's truly astounding to see once you shift um, the design of a space and play with people's expectations, that that even allows for different conversations to happen. And talking about the global scale, I do believe that one of the things um, to start thinking about is how do we create how do we again travel the scales of things and, and work more in assemblages and also understand that there's so many a priori that we need to get into because if we if we think that we can just like slap a, a civic tech space uh on, and layer it on top of society as it exists we're we're gonna get exactly where we are now and it's really interesting to see cases such as uruguay that were you know they preceded barcelona and all of these other places that have become quite famous for their their openness in terms of digital democracy but they, they, you know, uh, Uruguay has advanced in terms of being incredibly socially progressive at the same time as their technology opened up and advanced as well. So how do we start thinking about education and civics? How do we think about these other civic spaces that need to happen at many scales, at both at the neighborhood level, the street level? Um, and well, no, I think I'll stop there, but there's so many thoughts uh, that come from, from the conversation right now. Yeah. Well, I want to just get down then to the um, to the how questions, and so I think we can all name the questions and the importance. I want to talk though a little bit about prototyping trust. I've been thinking about this a lot in design spaces, and I want to you know just I know a lot of people here are designs designers and engineers of various kinds, and they are tasked with the building and the choices, and there can be a kind of sclerotic process by which people think, oof, now that I know these can be tools of harm. I am more I'm more cautious, which is a good thing, but it might actually prohibit some of the creativity, the piloting, the breaking our sort of shedding some of the old scripts about how we're going to interact online for fear of that causing harm. So I guess I want to talk to you all about prototyping as a kind of disposition for what builders do. That is, so in my neighborhood in Cambridge, Mass, you know, shared streets was piloted at small scale, reversible small scale. So we had three streets initially with, you know, temporary bollards and things, and then we had the signage and community feedback and so on. But there was plenty of chatter online about saying, trying a new thing will never work, and I can tell you why, and the kind of self-satisfaction of that, right? And I think that the trust in sort of powers that be is not just earned by sheer conversation and discourse. I mean, Danielle, I wonder what you think about this. But by the prototyping, those piloting of little projects and delivering new imaginaries for ways that we can be so that you then establish that trust from which you then can proceed in redesigning the worlds that we want. It's a delicate balance. And I think a lot of people who do human-centered design and engineering work think, well, you build consensus first and then you make something. And it's just never that, it's never that linear. I wonder if folks have thoughts about that, people who are tasked with the building work. Yeah, 
I, I would add, and, and let me say for my audio description, this is Philip, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged uh, white man sitting in a spare room with a ladder behind me. Um, uh, I would say that I, that's such a good point, the, this difference between experimentation and, des, and uh, design up front. I, I guess as someone who's worked on this stuff all my life now, maybe it's just that I'm dumb, but I doubt it. We as humans are not able to predict the outcomes of most of these systems that we're designing not even close the 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 sort of design uh matrix you know we're only able to imagine doing two or three things differently in a digital space and there, and i guarantee i mean I, I really think that we have no idea what the outcomes of those things will be so we must prototype and yet especially today i feel as a person involved in building things in tech i and i respect this this problem i feel like there's a huge amount of anger directed toward tech at like rashly deploying things that are ultimately harmful for people so how do we strike a balance between knowing that that does often often happen and then also respecting that we have to experiment like all many of the emergent outcomes in second life there's no way i would have guessed at them and i was super philosophically interested in all this and passionately engaged in what might happen but I was reading Jane Jacobs' thank yous there at the very beginning. That was one of the books that really inspired me about building Second Life. But I could never have guessed at all the interesting, strange, emergent things that happened. So how do we strike that balance when everybody right now, I mean, not everybody, but a lot of people probably don't want us to experiment. And I get that. Not certainly with the exponential scale that seems to be the default mode of, of software and built into its architecture. But there again, may not be a foregone conclusion. What are the highly localized and bounded forms? Who else might have some response to this? I'm just adding to Sarah, your comment about prototyping. You know, um, with regards to disability technology, there's often a pushback from the disabled community because the prototypes are often like prescription. There are solutions designed by non, non um, disabled people to fix this disability asset. But often they're designed and engineered without the input from the disability community and pose even more challenges than it actually requires. So two examples come to mind, and both of them, by the way, can be very nicely described by um, the design critic Liz Jackson term disability dongle, in which you have a solution for a problem that disabled people never actually knew they had. And these two classic examples are the stair climbing wheelchair. Like rather than just dismantling barriers by putting ramps, you just have this complicated technology that in some cases is actually exclusive for wheelchair users that just climb stairs. And another one is this um, sign language glove, this computerized device that you wear in your hands to translate ASL to the spoken word, even though it doesn't actually capture the intricacies and the intimacy of the language. So I think when we're thinking about prototyping, um, many of the disability technology never go beyond the prototype stage because they actually don't solve the problem. I'm sorry, they don't solve the issue that they believe is the problem. And we think on a more broader scale in spaces and urban center, to what extent can these kinds of um, prototyping actually be exclusive for some people? Can I jump in here for a second, Sarah? Because um, I think this is really important and um, somebody put it in the chat as well that what we're talking about is an iterative design process. And that is absolutely key. But I think the other thing I would put alongside the iterative piece is a sort of inclusive conception about stakeholders. So one of the problems with emergent phenomena is that the timescales of emergence are kind of unpredictable. So in that regard, you need to make sure that you've got the kind of farthest sided people, so to speak, um, who care about a particular thing connected to the problem because different communities of users will see things sooner than others because of just what they care about, what's salient to them. And so we have to like maximize our temporal capacity to see emergent things and that you only get through diversity um, of stakeholder inclusion. So it's a combination of iterative um, with the inclusive. And also, I think, Gabriella, your work demonstrates a pretty expansive notion of kinship and shared stakes, right? Including uh, overlooking some of the, you know, complications of a city that might exceed your bounds, but nonetheless working together. Um, I mean, you've, you've thought a lot about this, about the thorny nature of participation. 
Absolutely. And, and I do think that many times uh, creating um, these tiny microcosms basically lets you, allows for more voices to come in because I, I do think that there's an interesting uh, way forward in terms of how do we do politics of possibility or how, how do, do we do policy that signals possibility, if you will, where it's not necessarily the government that comes and creates the whole sentence, but you start off a sentence or you just point to something and create the framework of a space or a story that people can write themselves into in a way. Um, so we found that when we were prototyping certain types of projects, for example, um, that were weirdly controversial, because I would have thought that, for example, creating public space for neighborhoods would be uh, just like a, a no brainer. But it turns out that neighbors were worried about everything from noise to uh, attracting people to their uh, to their doorstep, because in many of these uh, Mexico City, 60 percent inform started 60 percent as a, a self-built environment. So informality was a big way that Mexico City uh, got built. And so but public space was never accounted for. So one of the things that we worked on closely was how do you create typologies in, and create public space where there isn't, as I mentioned. And a really interesting thing were, happened that we had to work very intensely with neighbors at the beginning, which was actually quite incredible because in some neighborhoods, the neighbors didn't know each other. So it was actually an excuse to create conversations that had not happened before. But once we had the first, for example, permanent uh, kid street up, instead of having to um, push our way into the hearts of people, it was actually the other neighbors looking at that and saying like, why don't we have one? You know, that's completely unfair. So I have the feeling that there's something incredibly powerful of not only of thinking about public and political imagination at the same time as we think about these other things, like how, how do we open up that space and sense of possibility? Um, and how can actually our, our projects, both in the digital as well as the urban space, actually point to that which could be possible or, or because so many times we're constrained by what we see and what we're immersed in. Um, so uh, yes, I think that that's an interesting space to explore. Uh, and yet, I mean, I just, I wanna bring into, I think my colleague uh, Mara Mills is here today and Mara was, we were on a, uh, doing an event together about AI and the, the, just the scale of corporate ownership of data and the way that drives the way AI and, and machine learning function in designing our online interactions. And Mara said that, you know, historians talk about the way that these software platforms have become governance without government. So mm -hmm. as opposed to what you just described, Gabriella, of the way that you build at the site of the, the municipality and the informal city and the knowledge sharing that happens and so on, that the proximity that's implied there, that you go, we've gone straight to governance without government at the scale of software. I mean, is that a, Danielle, is that a thing that comes up in um, kind of uh, ethical circles around technologies and software? I'm just thinking about, the distinction between governance as a you know de facto capability as opposed to government as an institution. Absolutely, I mean, um, you know, I think governance is a theme that understanding of governance is sort of atrophied in the general public, also in the world of policymakers. I think we have gotten too reliant on the idea that you develop a solution up front and then you just implement. And governance is not implementation, right? Governance is about creating a shared purpose that goes back to Gabriella's story about the meal together. Yeah, and then iterating through the solution so that there's genuine ownership. When I was talking about participatory rights, that's about co-ownership of what you're making together. And then that builds legitimacy. Legitimacy is the purpose of governance, is to ensure that as you deliver concrete solutions, you're doing it on a sturdy foundation of legitimacy. So you need that process of working together, um, really, I think, to deliver um, you know, healthy, uh, socially productive results. Yeah. And that's a very different picture of policymaking, I just want to say out loud too. It's not just a difference for technology, it's a different picture for policymaking. Because in policymaking spaces too, the idea is that you, you know, blueprint a macro level solution and then your job is to implement. Um, and we're instead talking about working our way to the solution um, emergently through process. Uh, it's a total transformation of conception. Yeah, and requires, it seems to me, a kind of intellectual flexibility that can dive deeply down into details and then revisit the macro. It's that it's an iterative intellectual process, I think too, right? Being radically attentive to the, the texture of daily life. And then also, you know, this kind of the sort of hopping, you yeah. know, big dynamic. If I may add there, um, in, in terms of cities, as well as technology wanting to optimize for efficiency, 
uh, this is not efficient. So the, it's a completely different ethos. It's a completely different set of principles. It's a never ending question conversation and it does not stop. It is not solved. You do not solve the city. You do not solve a digital space. You do not solve governance. Um, so I think that that's where one of the biggest tensions lies right now. Exactly. It's the overarching objectives. If your only overarching objective is a kind of cost benefit analysis, you can have a blueprint and try to implement, so to speak. But if your goal is participation and that co-ownership of the results, then by definition, it all has to proceed differently. And it's, it is not efficient in the same way that a cost benefit um, approaches. However, insofar as you secure social trust and the foundations of legitimacy over long arcs um, of effort and work, it is, I think, in fact, de delivers positive social results at a much higher level, which is a different way of thinking about what efficiency is. Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, and I, I just have to call out again, Gabriella's team that included the humanist nature of um, folks in philosophy, folks in the arts that tend not to be shunted into the machinery of efficiency and systems in that way, but nonetheless draw our attention to this much bigger idea, Danielle, of thriving and flourishing. No? Mm -hmm. like, I wish my country understood a tiny bit of this, right? The wisdom that is there in trying to create the systems that we want. All right, I thank you so much for being game to do these kind of big conceptual leaps and find the analogies and where they break down. I do hope, thank you so much to um, folks, you know, animating the chat and and uh, adding your questions and your ideas. Uh, there's plenty of um, space to go and discuss. Thanks to our hosts and to New Public for just, again, shoring up the imagination that we can, it can be otherwise. We can have a designed otherwise future and the, the civic possibilities therein. Um, so thanks again to our guests and I'll turn it over to New Public.